Hello, my lovely Rose Garden, and welcome to a, shall we say, charged review. I'm Avalon Rosalind, indie author, and your system-breaking genderqueer narrator for the evening. This review was requested by my patron, Captain Snapdragon. If there is a book you'd like me to read and review, please consider becoming a patron. Your support allows me to continue writing and making videos. In return, you get great rewards like access to exclusive channels in the Rose Garden Discord server, the ability to make review requests, your username in the credits of my videos, and your name in my book dedications, and more. With reward tiers starting at just $2 a month, it's easy to support me and reward yourself. A Brother's Price by Wen Spencer falls into the speculative genre of fiction. It's hard to say if it would be considered fantasy or science fiction by fans of either genre, but it definitely isn't set in the real world. The world of A Brother's Price differs from ours in one distinctive way, which informs the rest of the book. The birth rate of male children is extremely low. Enter our protagonist, Jaren, the soon-to-be-of-age oldest son of the valorous but troublesome Whistler family. His expansive family of sisters, mothers, and a few younger brothers are relying on his dowry, or brother's price, to secure their future, either by trading him for a husband of their own, or, through a twist of fate we'll get into, by commanding a price so high that they can expand out from their farm and afford to buy a husband outright. A few words might have grabbed you in that premise, so let's address the main point of the book, how men are treated in this world. In this world of few men and many women, men are a highly valuable commodity because they are necessary for procreation. As such, they are the legal property of their mothers and sisters, and no true effort is made to hide the fact that at the end of the day, they're bought, sold, and traded like livestock to preserve the livelihood of their female counterparts. Even Jaren's loving family has a few moments where they uncomfortably grapple with the fact that they might not be able to make choices based on Jaren's happiness, no matter how much they'd like to. Also, since there are few men and many women, polygamy is the norm. Men are expected to service their several wives, maintain the home, care for the children, basically everything that we in the West would consider a traditionally feminine role men do in this world. They are protected by the women in their lives in exchange for safety and servitude. That is, if all goes well. The Whistler family is a particularly loving and even progressive bunch, allowing Jaren to learn to read, write, and use weapons, owing to the family's colorful history, which I'll get to later. But not all men are so lucky. Some are traded or sold off to abusive wives, and the worst possible fate for a man is to end up in a crib, a brothel where they are drugged and forced to service women for ten crowns a night, while their female family reaps their earnings. Because reproduction is the primary goal due to the scarcity of chances to become pregnant, all sex is unprotected, meaning that the risk of STDs is rampant, especially in the cribs, and a disease like syphilis could wipe out an entire family since all the wives share a husband. There are men who kill themselves rather than end up in a crib or be married to abusive wives. The world of A Brother's Price never seems to be completely commentary or cautionary tale. The characters do take time to discuss the problems of their world, but never feel like mouthpieces for Spencer's own views. They never lose sight of the fact that they are characters who were raised in this society and are accustomed to these gender roles and social conditions. At one point, Jaren even muses over the idea of a world where men are more populous than women and wonders if, in that world, many men would share a wife. The person he's talking to points out that this wouldn't really work out since it takes women almost a year to have a child, while a man can sire many children in a much shorter time frame and with far fewer resources. 
This doesn't feel like a gotcha moment aimed at the reader, but like two characters having a legitimate hypothetical discussion about what they think a different kind of world would be like based on their own experiences and socialized expectations. Basically, A Brother's Price takes the idea of a harem fantasy and filters it heavily through the female lens, while still including all the bodice ripper tropes of dime store adult romances. Sometimes the role reversal makes these moments hilarious to the readers raised in Western culture and gender norms. Other times it's disturbingly played straight and reminds us that anyone could be a victim of assault. By now, I'm sure you've noticed how many content warnings I've had to cram into the book information section on the screen. I personally found A Brother's Price to be a fun and fast-paced read, but you really need to know what you're getting into before picking it up because, well, it has all the Bodice River tropes. In spades. Once you understand that, though, the triggering content really isn't that different from most other spicy romance books you would find on bookstore shelves. One thing that did make me legitimately uncomfortable was the handling of queer characters. There is one bisexual character revealed much later in the book, and the way that it's handled is not great. Essentially, AFAB prostitutes present themselves masculinely to attract women, which wouldn't bother me too much, but they are exclusively referred to as whores, and it is implied that only the most desperate and horny of women would deign to sleep with another girl. The bisexual character is stated to have been in a relationship with another woman at one time, but it isn't expanded upon very much, especially since she shows up so late into the book, so there is very little in the way of LGBT representation, and it is almost entirely negative. Given that this book was published in 2008 and is already playing with gender roles, it seems like a bit of a missed opportunity. I mean, points for having a confirmed bisexual character in the aughts, I guess, but I did not like how this was handled. Okay, now let's talk about the actual plot. Jaren's older sisters and mothers are away for some reason I frankly don't remember, leaving him, his middle sisters, youngest sisters, and little brothers home alone. His middle sisters, who are supposed to be in charge of protecting the farm, go off to flirt with the neighbor boy, so when the alarms are raised, Jaren has to actually go out and rescue a woman found injured in the creek. This woman turns out to be Princess Odelia, whose older sister, Princess Wren, comes to collect her. Of course, she and Jaren instantly fall in lust, but he, a farmer descended from common soldiers, could never hope to be a good match for the princesses. But wait. Jaren's grandmothers, who were highly skilled thieves and soldiers, actually kidnapped a royal prince back in the day, meaning that Jaren is descended from royalty, but not too closely related to the princesses. And he is owed a favor due to saving Odelia's life. Under the guise of sponsoring his debut in society, Princess Wren schemes to convince her sisters that they should definitely marry Jaren. And if he's able to land noble wives, he'll fetch a brother's price that will pave his family's way for a prosperous future and ensure that his brothers and sisters also get to have happily ever afters of their own. At the same time that this is happening, there is still the matter of someone tried to kill Odelia to deal with. Someone has a grudge against the royal family and wants the princesses dead, and Jaren becomes a target as well due to his proximity and also being a very pretty man that can be leveraged against them, if not outright stolen away to hurt them further. It's one part Jane Austen novel, one part speculative western mystery, and the blend of everything worked together so well. There are a lot of flavors here that you might not think would mix well, and I certainly didn't when I read the synopsis, but if you give it time to marinate, it's surprisingly good. Beyond Jaren, I also enjoyed the host of princesses, sisters, and the other prominent male character, because, of course, in true parody fashion, there is only one other boy in the book, introduced later on, and he mostly talks to Jaren about girls. But he is so fun that I don't even care. I love Colin and his chaotic rich boy energy. 
I fully understand if someone sees the list of content warnings and doesn't want to read the book for themselves. But if you think you can handle most spicy romance books, I'd say that A Brother's Price is worth giving a chance. For those who really don't want to take on that challenge, though, it's time for spoilers. If you are leaving the video now, please remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. I make videos about the books I read and the books I write, and your support really makes a difference for an indie author like me. If you're interested in supporting me even further, please consider buying my books or becoming a patron. You can find the links to my website, Patreon, Ko-fi, and social media accounts in the description. I debated making a spoiler section for this book because there really are no surprises here if you're familiar with genre conventions and tropes, but here it is just in case you aren't. As Austin Land put it, every romance was intended to lead to marriage. So of course Ren and Jaren fall in love immediately and Ren starts plotting how to marry him, and maybe a little over halfway through the book, she succeeds. All the princesses are on board for marrying Jaren, even the eight-year-olds that he disturbingly refers to as his child brides, which... Why? Why not just imply that the youngest princesses will get a husband of their own later? It might be one thing if they were almost of age and he was teasing. I mean, it would still be pretty squicky, but bearable. But his interaction with them is used as proof that he'll be a good father, meaning they are young enough to be lumped in with the siblings that he has been raising, and I... Oh, I do not like that. But as I just said, this is at about two-thirds through the book, so what takes up the final act? Figuring out who tried to kill Odelia, and then dealing with Jaren being kidnapped, of course. The mystery aspect of this novel is not disappointing. It isn't bad. It is just very the character that you are suspicious of from the moment she appears, that's the villain. Now, her plan is a little more involved than I initially thought, in part owing to Jaren and the Whistler family throwing some unexpected wrenches in it, but if this lady had a mustache to twirl, you can bet she'd be twirling it. She is definitely doing the shoujo manga villainous laugh after every other line of dialogue. It's pretty obvious. I am, of course, talking about Kij Porter, whose brother married the royal sisters before being killed in a bombing that he was supposed to get out of the way of, but was too dumb to actually do so. Also, he is screwing his sister the entire time, and her daughter is a product of that incest, so that's fun. And I am going to pause for just a second here and address the brother-slash-dead-husband of the princesses, Kiefer, because he was a piece of work. The eldest sister was taken in by his looks and good breeding and refused to take no for an answer when it came to marrying him, and the moment they were married, a switch was flipped and he turned into an irredeemable asshole, being verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive with the princesses. Trini, in particular, to the point that she was so traumatized that Ren thought convincing her to marry again was going to be nearly impossible. And I actually like this, because it shows that even in this reverse gender stereotypes world, anyone can be an abuser and anyone can be a victim. Trini had a substantial amount of societal power over this man, but once you are locked in a room alone with a person, there is no society to leverage power in. Also, she was 13. Anyway, back to Kidge's master plan. Because Kiefer Porter was married to the princesses, making her family the royal sisters-in-law, they enter the line of succession. Should all the princesses die without producing any heirs, the crown will go to the Porter family. This is the impetus for her to kill off the princesses by stealing weapons and violently doing them in. When Jaren enters the picture, he complicates things because he might sire heirs to the princesses, so he's gotta go. However, rather than kill him too, Kish realizes that because he has distant royal blood through his grandfather, it would be more strategic to steal and marry him instead of the princesses. I don't know exactly how she thought that was going to fly, since everyone would know she had stolen him from the royal family, but 
That's the idea. It actually turns out that Kiefer dying in the blast actually furthered her plan because it took her off the list of suspects who would have plotted against the princesses. Happy accident, I guess. What she didn't expect was that one of the only surviving princesses of the bombing would be on her trail and figure out her plan alongside Jaren, or that Jaren would be a very capable lockpick and fighter in his own right, due to said Whistler grandfather being insistent that the male children of the family be taught to read, write, and fight, as well as the girls for their own protection. Honestly, I would be kind of interested in more lore about this world and the Whistler family in general, since Grandpa Whistler is an entirely posthumous character who seems so fun. The backstory here is that there was a civil war caused by the royal family splitting, known as the War of the False Eldest. Prince Alannon was kidnapped by the Whistler women, who were common soldiers at the time, which he did not like, but given that his other option was being executed with the rest of his family as punishment for losing the war, he tolerated it. He then made many demands of his new wives so he could live in at least an approximation of the royal comfort he was accustomed to, including the previously mentioned lessons for their sons, building a bathhouse, and other things. It paints this picture in my mind of this, like, reverse Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs situation. Prince Alannon really looked at his situation, took a deep breath, and said, Time to make the best of this and make sure my male descendants are never kidnapped like I was. And then he did, and he was awesome. So, that was a brother's price. If I can say anything about this book, it's that it was interesting. I honestly can't really liken it to any other story I've read before. If you can stomach the content and think it sounds interesting, it's definitely worth checking out. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Leave your emoji relating to money of choice in the comments and tell me, how much do you think your marriage price would be worth? Wrong answers only. Thank you so much for watching, and a special thank you to my patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or in the description below, please consider joining my Patreon. Your support means so much to me and allows me to continue making content. If you want to support my content in different ways, consider buying my books, donating on coffee, subscribing to the channel, or even just giving this video a like and comment. Any and everything is appreciated so much. Keep growing till next time, Rose Garden!